so speaking of, of perhaps nerve wracking homilies, uh, in September, you gave one of the most poignant homilies uh, I think I've, I've heard you preach as far as just speaking to the heart of, of the congregation, but the heart of the country in, in many ways. And, and you spoke about politics, but, but you did it in a really particular way. Um, mm -hmm. And so I'd encourage people to go back, I believe it was September 13th. Mm -hmm. uh, that homily was, was very, very powerful. Thank you. Right now, Jesus Christ wants to stretch out his broken arms and say to you that with all his heart, he loves you. Mr. Trump, Mr. Pence, Mr. Biden, Ms. Harris, Democrats, Republicans, I would rather die than hate you. Do you get nervous going into a homily where you're gonna talk about politics and something that, you know, is just so divisive and? I was not nervous there. I have been nervous. And the more that I'm, we are pushed and we are pulled by the parishioners to make dogmatic statements about politics and politicians. And, and we know that, I, I know that that is about the most wrong thing that a clergyman can do. All the clergymen of other denominations do it. I don't get it. But I have uh, learned that, um, you know, people get so worked up over politics that you'd think it was important and it's not. I mean, what's important is that we in this country be safe from harm inside and out, that we be given the freedom to worship and educate our children the way that we want to, that we be allowed to work according to our physical ability and our intellectual acumen. You know, so there are those, those things that I think are really important, a mother and father taking care of their children, so important. But further the away that you get from the core of that, the less important it really is. Yeah. So people get worked up like this is life and death. And politics will not save you. And inevitably, a political party, you can choose one or the other or them both. Those parties are going to disappoint you. It, they're, we're human. And you go belong to one because it's just the way in compromise that the parties work when they are able to compromise. And I don't mean wishy-washy but when they stake out some principles and move toward inclusion, I think that's the way the country is best run. Um, I think that they're made up of humans and they'll disappoint you. And you know, an economic system will disappoint you. I mean, certainly the totalitarian economies, communism, the Nazis, the fascists, they will not only disappoint you, they'll kill you right. because they'll take away your money and give it to the chosen few. But capitalism is what we're working with. Capitalism will disappoint you. Ask the people who are poor in this country and don't have jobs. So you keep yourself close to Jesus. You put on, as St. Paul said in the letter to the Philippians, put on Christ. You know, be aware that everybody else on the face of this earth is more important than you are. And that you are here to serve them, not as to be a doormat, but you are there to consider them better than you and you are the servant, and you are to love them, and you are to serve them. And I think if more of us did that, we would be developing a more sturdy and a safer country. So I think that we ought to bring, you know, the mind and the heart of Christ to everything that we do, including the elections. And that the operative question is, what would Jesus do? Is that old armband that kids used to wear 10, 12 years ago? It's an operative question. It's the question, when I pull this lever, when I engage in this party to get creative politics and governing done, what would Jesus have me do? And Jesus would have you do love one another, walk the extra mile for one another, give the shirt off your back. Uh, all of those feed the hungry, feed the poor, all of that in Matthew 25 is what Jesus would have you do. And so I said and I read that um, you know, I would really rather die than hate. I mean, there's a lot of hate. There's a lot of hate. I mean, people say, I hate him. Yeah. And I hate her. And we'll rise up and we'll, even people are getting killed in these confrontations that are racial, social, and political. They're, it's all hard to keep it all together. Yeah. And so I would rather die than hate anybody because it's the hate that will send me to hell. I have to own the hate. It's not his fault 
or her fault that I hate them. It's my fault, and I have to own that hate, and then that hate will send you into the fiery pits of hell, and I don't want to go there. I'd rather go to heaven. Yeah. So pe people think, you know, people think that life is from, you know, what we say in the prayer of the faithful about abortion is that life is from conce conception to natural death. So they think, well, do you know what I mean? I got 70, 80, 90 years. You, you have been alive. You can't even put a word on how long you've been alive in the heart of God. And you're going to spend a very short, let's just say 90 years on the face of this earth, and you are going to be alive for another gazillion eons. Your life is really, really long. And what you do now influence doesn't influence where you came from. You came from the love of God, but it sure influences where you're going. And I don't want to be in hell for those eons. Yeah. So life is long. Death is a passage. You know, is, is there anything particular to our Catholic faith and particular to our Catholic identity that, uh, that speaks to how we engage in discourse? There's um, what we call social justice teaching and documents that go back to the late 1800s that guide our conversation in matters political. And since they were written by popes, okay, written by bishops and theologians, but gone over by popes and signed by popes, they're not meant for America. You know, you Americans, it's meant for the whole world. So they were writing in the late 1800s all the way until Pope Francis for countries in the world who have really disparate economies and disparate senses of politics. Uh, and especially during the communist and the totalitarian eras. So they're meant for us all, and they give us they give us the focus, and they give us the vocabulary to bring to the conversation. Yeah. But I think the the first step is to listen in all humility, and the second step is to love. And I bet if you boil down all the documents, though you should read them, the social justice documents they're easy to find on the uh, U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops website usccb.org. But we do. We do have clear guidance from Scripture and from our teachers. Yeah. The Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Alito. Do you want to talk about that at all? Or? It's so, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a, a Jewish person. I think maybe of a more liberal persuasion. I saw a lady rabbi somewhere in the works. And uh, Justice Scalia was a very, very good Catholic, a very traditional Catholic. Uh, they he, has fought, a, he has a son who's a priest. a son, Father Paul, who gave yeah. one of the most brilliant funeral homilies for his father I ever heard in my life. He's a priest in Arlington. I think he's the vicar for vocations. Mm -hmm. Not sure. It's a brilliant. He went to William & Mary uh, while I was at St. Bede in Williamsburg. Really? Yeah, I used to see Justice. I told, uh, I told uh, you know, Jesus tells a lot of lawyer stories. So one day <laughs> in the old church, I told a lawyer joke. And they laughed, whatever it was. I forget the punchline. So we got a good laugh out of that. And we... Went out and I'm shaking hands as a goodbye, have a nice day. And the man, man walked up to me, I had no idea. And he said, um, that was a very good joke. I'm a lawyer too. And I said, well, it's nice to meet you. I'm glad you liked it. And he gave me his business card and he was Justice Scalia. <laughs> and he had come he had come with his wife to be see his son, who was an undergraduate at William & Mary. Oh, um, How funny. They could, they could, it was beautiful. They apparently could fight tooth and nail over policy and law in the United States of America, and then be the best of lunch companions. And well, I read just recently after the justice died, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, that uh, he was either her anniversary or maybe she was recovering from an illness, but he brought a dozen red roses to her office. I mean, this is the way we all could be. You know, we could be ideologically opposed as all get out, and you get to say so. You have two reasons to say why you think that and why you think that but love one another. These are two towering people, so brilliant, but were humble enough. Off feet, humble comes from the word humus, earth. Mm. So their feet were on the ground of the earth enough to love one another. Jewish, Christian, but you know, wow, what a story that is. Yeah. What an example for this country. Yeah, beautiful. And yeah. a good reminder of this, this juncture. Yeah, especially.